as we get started this morning. I, I, I feel like I have to say this just because, I don't know, I, I, I used to come home from work. This was a very normal thing. I used to come home from work to a house filled with the music we just sang. Barb was really big in Integrity Hosanna's music. And so we have, anybody here ever heard of a cassette tape? <laughs> we had cassette tape, so we, we would put that, she would put that in the player, and she would hit the, the reverse thing, so it would get to the end, and hit the button and turn around and play the other side, and it just played constantly. Uh, so I just felt like I was in a place of worship as I was thinking back to my kids, uh, meeting me at the door with that music playing, and anybody ever here ever have those kind of reminiscent thoughts when you're in church when you're worshiping when you hear a song that just kind of triggers I'm the same way with 80s rock we'll be, we'll be somewhere and, and a song will come on and Barb will be like how do you even know this song it's been so long I'm like I can tell you when this song came out I can tell you what I was doing I can tell you what I did because of this song you don't want to know about that and so you know I mean, I, I, so thank you, Summer, and, and worship team for that, because that was just a, that was a wonderful time of worship for me. I, 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 I want to consider, I want to continue to consider the, the church this week, and, and I found myself wondering how, how so many church buildings can exist in a small area and still survive. I mean, financially, numerically, how how do so many churches make it in such a small place? I don't know if you've ever taken time to uh, count how many churches are in a small area, but if, if you grew up where Barbara and I grew up, uh, those towns, they had a church on just about every corner. It was like, you go into town, and we, lived, we both lived out, separate sides, but we both lived out of town, like in the mountains and the hills and, and, um, and country area. But when we would go into town, you pass First Methodist, then you pass the Assemblies of God, then the Nazarene Church was over there, the Catholic Church was here, and then it started over, it seemed like, as you kept going through town. There, there were so many churches in such a small area, and I just always wonder what makes people want to attend one church over another. Why would someone choose to come to Spring Hill Calvary over some other Christian gathering? Because we're dead. What, what do people... <laughs> <laughs> what, do people, what do people look for when they're considering where they will attend? Or even if they will attend? You know, that's a big question too. If they will attend a church. This has been a point of interest for me for a long time and it's it's somewhat of a challenge to figure it out. Each place I've lived has had different dynamics. And and each place has required a different idea maybe about how to lead and what should be the focus. With that said, there have also been some constants, some things that just don't go away in each place that I've, I've, I've been, and, and they, they never change. I hope they never change. First and foremost is that the church is built on a solid foundation, teaching, so, solid, I can't get this word out. It's right there. The solid foundational teaching <coughs> of Jesus Christ as the one and only Son of God. That's, that's a must. He and He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father in any other way than through faith in Jesus. And acceptance of Him as Savior and Lord of their life. Right? Now, after this foundation is established, it's important to decide what you will believe about the working of the Holy Spirit. 
Does he give power to live a holy life? Does he direct our path? Is he in complete control or do we have choices? Is he automatically involved in, in the life of every believer or do we have to realize he is there and ask him into our lives? Much like our salvation experience when we first believed in Jesus. See, all of these questions, they really have to be answered before we can think about who we want to associate with each week in our worship experience. They're questions that all of you have asked at one point or another. They're really not surprising questions, although sometimes it's hard to hear a preacher get in the pulpit and call your attention to things that you might not want to hear. Well, that happens every week here, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's take a look at what the early followers of Jesus did in their gatherings and compare their church service to ours. Would you please stand with me in honor and reverence to the Word of God? I'll be reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And I'm going to be in a New American Standard Bible today. It says this, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. There is a reading. You can be seated. And let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for the challenge of your word. I thank you for the ability to come and praise you, to worship you through song. And God, I pray that you would help us worship you through this message today. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross, that I would only speak your word. But Lord, just in case, I pray that your spirit would go and protect every ear that hears, that they would only hear what you have for them today. The Lord, that you would draw them, each one, to yourself through your message today. We'll give you all the glory and praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody say Amen. 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 I spent some time this past week thinking about how I landed in the Church of the Nazarene. It was a, it was a long road for me. And, and it took me from one denomination to another. I didn't start out as a Nazarene. Some of you were born and raised in the Church of the Nazarene. I did not start that way. I, I, I had quite a few experiences, and, and so I spent time going from one denomination to another when I was trying to figure this all out. I also visited some non-denominational places. I, I wasn't tied to anything in particular. I was tied to Jesus. And so I was trying to figure out where I needed to be so that I could understand better how to worship Him where He put me. That's what brought this whole question and what I'm preaching about today to life for me. I landed in this denomination because they were the closest thing to what I believed. I believed God was teaching me certain things and He wanted me to understand things about Him and this is where I found that. I believe it's important for us to consider what God is leading us to understand. Many times we find ourselves in places where we don't really believe what's being taught. You ever been there? Sometimes we find ourselves there and what happens is that we have choices to make. We can either decide to embrace what, they're, what we're hearing, what they're teaching, or we can go and find a place where we can hear something that we can accept. Now, either of those 
is acceptable. But we need to be careful when this happens because we could be looking at what the Bible refers to as, as having our ears tickled. We don't want that. 2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myth. This means that we are looking for someone to tell us that we're right. That's, that's what they're talking about. That we're looking for someone to tell us that we're right. We have it all together. We're doing good things and, and we don't need to do anything more. To me, that would be a pretty scary place to be. Because that would be a place that I might become satisfied or comfortable. And, and, I, and I believe Jesus warned us not to allow this kind of teaching or else we could become as worthless as used salt. That's another scripture, by the way. The other option is that we could fall into becoming cynical and negative. Now, I know none of you are this person and none of you know anybody like this, but we could, we could become cynical and negative. Uh, those kind of people are always trying to get other people on their side. And they're always building their allegiances last week, right? They're building those allegiances. They're stirring things up and trying to make people think things are going south, headed toward the gutter. Like I said, I know you guys don't know anybody like this. They don't like that kind of study. They think things are getting too liberal. They're not being fed. You know, they just don't like the pastor. They, they liked the way things were. I mean, why do we have to change anyway? This thinking only results in tearing down God's kingdom. This kind of thinking never, never builds anything. It's sad, but sometimes <coughs> things happen to make people grow apart. And sometimes a difference in opinion will fester into a lot more than it should. So we have to be on guard. We have to be careful. Because what somebody says might not really be what they mean. I'm often guilty of that. I have Barb close. And she tells me all the time, that didn't come out well. <laughs> Please don't be offended by me. And if you're trying to offend me, you have to start with this. Pastor, this is meant to offend you. <laughs> and then you can tell me and I'll get it. But if you're just, I'll probably miss it if you're just trying to offend me. Mm. I want you to know this for sure. I don't ever want anyone to leave this church. I want to see people come and remain for as long as they're living in this area. I want people to walk into this building and feel the Holy Spirit so strong that they decide right away, this is their church home. And they will attend every... Oh, wait. I shouldn't add this to the sentence, probably. But I'm going to do it anyway. And they will attend every time the doors are open. Amen. What an idea. That's a concept that we haven't really been into too much anymore, have we? Huh. So the question becomes, why attend this church over some other church? Because God uses people in different ways. Meaning that some enjoy what others don't. Now I know this doesn't happen here because you guys all think the same. You all go to the same places. You all do the same things. You never want to do something different than everybody else, right? That's why every time we go to a restaurant after church, all 130 of you show up at that same restaurant, right? You see, God uses one church to reach one people group, and he's using another church 
to reach another people group. God may be using a church like ours to show people that there's strength in walking with the Holy Spirit. Amen. He may be calling people to live a holy life as they hear a message of hope through our messages. He may be asking us to help people who have been burnt by religion or bored with tradition or lost in the show of church. He may be reaching out to the people who have been kicked to the side of the road or thrown a curveball or confused by someone's opinion. Through this gathering of people, he may be doing something amazing. Amen. He may be planning to use our church as a place where people who have not been accepted in other gatherings Amen. can come and hear truth and find Jesus and His saving grace. Amen. That's the key. That's the key. I'd like to think that we here at CC Naz are a little different than the church down the street or around the corner. I'd like to think this is because we've been called by Christ to be something the other gatherings are not called to be. See, don't take this as a negative because every church is not set up to reach the same people. I have, I've been in, like I said, I've been in multiple places and many of you have too. I've been in places where there's always this this one church that seems to be busting at the seams. They just seem to be going crazy. People are coming. Everybody wants to go to that church. Why? Well, the truth is, most of us don't ever know because we don't ever go to find out. But there's usually something that they're doing well. I'll just throw out some obvious. Hillsong. Anybody ever heard of Hillsong Church? I think probably most of us. It runs like in the tens of thousands of people to go there. Why do they go there? Because their worship experience is incredible. They pour all of their resources into their music, into their band, into their live worship. Their speaker, their preacher, who is not always the same guy, by the way, even though there is a lead pastor, their preacher is dynamic and excited. And, and really, really wants to get the word across. And he gets it across, or she gets it across, as they're worshiping in that same spirit of worship. There's something that draws them. Each church has something that is either drawing us or pushing us away. I would like for C.C. Naz to be a place where people are drawn by the Holy Spirit Amen. to worship in the way that He's leading us to worship. Amen. But the truth is that we have to do things different from the others. Catch this. This is, this is a pretty profound thought. If we don't do things like the others, or if we don't do things different than other people, we're just like everybody else. Hmm. And when we're like everyone else, we don't really have anything that sets us apart. But by us doing things a little bit different, some people who would never be a part of the church may be drawn to Christ through the gathering, through this gathering. I, I, I feel kind of bad because last week I made it a point to talk about the fact that I am the preacher that usually is in jeans and cowboy boots. And I didn't even think about that this morning when I got dressed. I just thought, I want to wear my khakis and my brown shoes. What sure will go with that? I did good, though, I think. I did not ask Barb if this went together. That's usually my first thing. And, and I actually had somebody make a comment about that last week. Wow, this preacher actually, actually, uh, and, yeah, that's a good word, coordinates. I said, I only do that because I ask Barb every morning. This is good. Uh, I, I was definitely, growing up, I was jeans and a flannel shirt forever. Um, then one day I realized that I didn't have anything but jeans and flannel shirts. So I went out and bought some t-shirts. <laughs> I, I thought I'd live on the edge. 
but the worst part was that was kind of the thing that changed. And from that point on, I have never really stayed the same. I change all the time. I don't like to be the same. I don't like that mundane that I feel when I'm doing the same kind of thing over and over and over. I feel like a church that, <laughs> that wants to attract people has to change, has to be willing to hear what the people around it need, want, are looking for, and find those things and incorporate them into their worship. I don't mean that we give away, the, I don't mean that we put away the gospel. The gospel is the most important thing we do. Amen. One of the things that I believe sets us apart is the way that we serve the community around us. We serve people outside our walls through our wow ministry. Amen. And I think that's a really big deal. We supply donated bread to many different areas of our community. And we're preparing to host what we believe will be a huge community yard sale in just a few days. I hope you're getting excited about that and you're going to be on board. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be great. Another ministry which Barb made a big deal about this morning is starting up in October is the Good News Club at Deltona Elementary. Now, this, this is an after-school club that's focusing on sharing the gospel with children. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine anything better than having somebody like a school principal or a school administrator call a church and say, will you come and tell our kids about Jesus? If you need motivation, that should motivate you to get involved. I mean, think about it. Will you come and tell our kids about Jesus? Wow. See, I see all of these things as ministries to people that God wants us to touch with His love. And I believe He's going to use each of these things to connect us to more people who need Jesus in their lives. Do you know, this is a cliche, I know, but it's the truth. Do you know that Jesus is the answer to all of our problems? Amen. Everything that we deal with, yes. if we would yes. get rid of it and fill it with Jesus. Yes. I know this. I have an addictive personality. I, I have been addicted to multiple things over the years. And giving it to Jesus is one thing. But when you fill it with Jesus, yes. when you fill that void with Jesus, oh. He truly changes us. He takes away those desires. Yes. Not always instantly. No. Sometimes, I'm going to use the word stupid here. Sometimes, I'm stupid. You see, I, I had I had this this one thing. You know, do you know that tobacco is like one of the most addictive? Yes. Nicotine is one of the most addictive drugs out there. Yes. Well, I had this issue with smokeless tobacco. And, and I came and I, I knelt at an altar and I was going home and listening to Hosanna praise, by the way. Uh, and I, I came and I knelt, at an altar, I knelt at an altar and God said, yes, my son, I'll take that from you. And it was gone. I didn't, it was gone. I didn't use it for weeks. And then one day I was out and I was like, you know, I'm going to buy a can of snuff. It's stupid, right? One time. That's all it took. I was back on it for a couple more years. And again, I went to the altar. Major conviction. Went to the altar and God said, okay, I'll do it. I'll take it away. And he took it away. And I was, I was done for, actually, I think two and a half years. I didn't use any stuff. One day I was at work and somebody offered me a pinch. Oh my gosh. And I took it. And you know what I did all the way home? I stopped and bought a can of snuff. Because that's how addictive it is. And that's my mentality. I'm either all in or all out, folks. Yep, yep. I'll tell you that. Yep. I'm in or out. I'm not one of those. I don't, I don't walk very well on the fence. I lose my balance. I'm all in or I'm out. And you know what? I, I got convicted again. And I went to the altar. And I said, God, you got to take this away. And he said, son, I'm taking this from you twice. <laughs> Absolutely not. Do it the hard way. Ouch. 
Ouch! I did it the hard way. I haven't had any of that stuff in 15 plus years. Wow. But point is, I get it. When you talk about, you talk about it's so easy to give it to Jesus and walk away. It's not always easy. But when you let Jesus fill the void, it's gone. Amen. Amen. It's gone. It doesn't mean you can't go back. It means it's gone. Let's see if we can get any thoughts about how this should look in our lives. It says, that day, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back to Acts chapter 2. 41 this time through 47. And I'm going to read from the message. It says, that day, 3,000 took him at his word were baptized and were signed up. I love that. I love the way the message puts things sometimes. That day, 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. Amazing. Amazing. Hang on. I just lost everything. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. Wouldn't you like everyone around to be in awe of what's happening here? Yes. All those wonders and signs done by the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wondrous harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned <clears throat> and pulled their resources so that they so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful, as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw, of course. Every day, their number grew as God added those who were saved. Wow. All, and all believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pulled their resources so that each person's need was met. Let me take a second to tell you some of the things that have been discussed lately. Probably you haven't noticed this, but just like this, don't, don't hold your hand up high. But anybody, here ever, anybody here notice that the parking lot's pretty bad shape. <coughs> or maybe you've seen a few leaks around the building. Maybe someone here is a numbers person and you've noticed that some people are missing. I've been accused of not talking about money from the pulpit enough. I don't know why people think that it's important for the preacher to preach about tithing. I haven't ever figured that out. When I was sitting in a chair, I didn't really like it when the preacher talked about tithing, and I don't really like to talk about tithing. But let me tell you why I'm always accused of this. See, I believe that when a person is changed by the love of Jesus Christ, they are motivated to learn about how he lived and what he asked of his followers. I also believe that when someone encounters the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit, He changes them and gives them a desire to do things that they hadn't done previously. Amen. Amen. Malachi speaks of the tithe in the Old Test in his Old Testament book. He is very direct when he tells the people that they will not be blessed if they withhold their tithe from the storehouse. We know that the storehouse is where you learn, where you understand where you grow so that means the storehouse is the church where they attend but the new testament doesn't really speak of the top not much instead we see passages like the one we just read the new testament followers they began to be generous they didn't so much focus on the top they were generous they sold all they had. Mm. They sold all they had and gave to everyone in their church who was in need. Nothing about 10% in that. Just 
Whatever you need, brother and sister, I'll give it to you. I'd say that that's living a generous life. Wouldn't you agree with that? Here's, here's a big thought for you. I've been praying. I have not been praying. I'm going to tell you the truth, and I know some of you are going to be disappointed. I have not been praying that somebody will pay for a new parking lot. I have not. I have been praying that God would put it on somebody's heart to pay off our mortgage. Do you know that we could pay off this mortgage in less than five years if we were serious about doing it? Oh, Pastor, what difference does that make? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> I was really worried that nobody was going to ask that question. If we, weren't, if we weren't paying for a mortgage, we could pave the parking lot without any problem, without any concern. If we, if we weren't paying for a mortgage, we could hire another staff person to help with some of these many ministries that are getting started and going crazy. We could repair or replace the roof where it's beginning to wear through. I don't know if you know this, but we probably have an air conditioner that's going to need to be replaced in the next year or so. We're going to have to do that. We would not have to worry about it. We could help our existing ministries accomplish more things without struggling to find funds. Do you realize that if we weren't paying a mortgage, the income here would be very different. The way we do things would be very different. That's why I'm praying somebody will say, Pastor, God has said for me to pay the mortgage. When you don't have a heavy debt hanging over your head, there are many things that you can do. But it takes more than a sermon about going about 10% tithing for that to happen. It takes more than somebody getting in a pulpit and saying, you all need to tithe. It takes people getting excited about what God can do and what He will do when they are obedient to His focus. And when we're ready, I know He will bless us beyond our current thoughts. I have experienced that and I know many of you have. I know that when we're ready, He has blessings to pour out on us. Amen. See, I envision a church complex here that is reaching many people for Jesus and providing a place for discipleship and for service. Amen. If you can see this, please call the office. Say, I need to sit down with Pastor Ed. We need to talk. I always need somebody to feed into my addictions. Amen. That's one of them. Reaching people for Jesus Amen. is what I all I am all about. Amen. Let's get back to the scripture. You can see from this passage why it's important for us to be in agreement about what we believe. It says in verse 41, That day about 3,000 took him at his word and were baptized and signed up. This is who committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to life together, <coughs> to the meal and to prayer. The 3,000 plus those who were already a part of the gathering. In other words, the church became part of one spirit. They shared life, possessions, and resources. They had everything in common and lived in harmony with each other. I don't know about you, but I don't think this means that they were close to some people and not others. I don't think they said, oh, I'm, I'm going to hang out with these guys, but not those guys. I don't think they talked good about these people and tore down these other people. I think they were one in thought, of one accord, of one purpose, and it was all about Jesus. So I understand that we're not going to all get along. Everybody that attends this church is not going to be best friends. But we should all have the same goal for the church. We should all want to see people saved. We should all want to see people grow in their faith. We should all want to hear the teachings of the Word. And we should all be willing to change whatever needs to be changed to make this happen. Amen. We should be excited about what God is doing in this place and want to do 
more. Want to be more. Want to be here together because we're afraid we might miss what God's going to do next. Look at verse 46 with me. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal of celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. These people gathered together every day. Some of you are like, you know, once a week's all I can take. <laughs> they gathered together every day. And after being together for prayer and teaching, they went to each other's houses to share a meal together and to celebrate what God's amazing power was doing in their lives. I believe that's saying a lot. I believe this is challenging us to be more involved or dedicated to the church. See, this, this is why verse 47 happened. Read it with me. It's up there. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. Every day. Do you want to know the truth? If you would truly begin to lift each other up, to have each other's back, to commit to loving each other and the church the way Christ loves His church, we would experience an outpouring like you've never seen. God's faithful. And He's true to His Word. He gives us example after example throughout Scripture of His intervention into lives as He draws people to faith. He's the one that draws them. We're just His hands and feet. And sometimes His mouth feet. If we want to experience Him like this, if we want to walk closer to Him through His infilling Spirit, He's here. But we have to get real with ourselves and each other first. We have to decide that it's time to commit to being more available and involved. And we have to allow God to work in us to bring us together in one spirit. That's important. If we're not focused on one main goal, reaching people for Jesus, we're missing the point. There's a good reason why people choose the church, one church gathering over another. It's because they connect with the people and they enjoy the service. <laughs> we have an opportunity to become the church known in this community for our unconditional love and, and acceptance. Amen. We, could, we could build a reputation as a church that serves others and cares for all people all the time. Yeah. And if we do as Christ has called us to do, we'll find ourselves loving multitudes to Jesus. Yeah. But, first we have to apply what God's Word is saying to us in our lives every day. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Will you devote yourselves to God's teaching? To fellowship with this community of believers? Will you devote yourself to prayer and hanging out with each other? Because if you will, God will bring people to Himself through you. There are multitudes around us who need to know Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord. And he will build His church. Can you stand with me?
I just want us to take a few minutes, quiet ourselves before God, and if you feel like the Spirit's calling you forward, grab somebody to pray with you. And come to the altar and pray. That's what they're here for. I, I've seriously considered taking the altars out. I know that will freak some people out. But I've seriously considered taking them out. I mean, we very seldom ever use them. They're not used for salvation anymore. They're just here as decorations. So, I guess what I'm saying is, if you really want me to leave them here, use them. And don't use them today because of that. Use them because the Spirit of God is saying, you need to come and give it all to me. That's what it's all about. Let's be what God's calling us to be. Because He has a lot of work for us to do. Let's take a couple seconds. Thank you. Listen to God. Let's pray. Oh God, we're amazed. You challenge us, you call us, you pull us closer, you give us things to do, and you and you make us into who we need to be. We ask God that you would help us to become more like you today. Help us to lay down our burdens. Help us to walk away from our addictions. Help us to stay closer to you and live closer to you. Help us, Lord, to see how you're changing us and changing our church so that we can share the gospel with more people. Help us, God, to be who you want us to be so that we can make a difference for you. Lord, help us to get out of the way and allow you to live in us and through us. Today, God, I pray for your blessing on this place. I pray for your blessing on each person that's praying right now. I pray, God, that you would make life real for them. That they would truly come to a place where they would lay it down for you and allow you to have control. Allow you to, to lead them in the right way. Allow you to take those things that keep pulling them backwards. Lord, in Jesus' name, fill those places. Fill those voids with Jesus. Fill those voids with spirit. Fill those voids with joy unspeakable. We would never turn back to the things that draw us away from you. Now God, I pray that you would bless the rest of this service. That you would be glorified through us as we join you at your table. That you would bless these elements that we're about to partake of, Lord, and that you would use them in some way to show us a deeper, closer walk with you. God, I pray that our lives would bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.